Welcome, my friends, to the Bomb Brad Podcast. My name is Mike Keenitz, and today I'm interviewing physical therapist Sarah Haig. She is an expert in urinary incontinence and bladder control. She is also the part owner in Entropy Physiotherapy and Wellness and the author of the book, Understanding and Treating Incontinence. So without further ado, here is Sarah. What are the treatment options for urinary incontinence? Uh, I am biased, but also super happy to say that most um, guidelines recommend conservative treatment first. So that would involve things like exercise, behavior change, um, bladder training, which would all fall under what a pelvic floor physical therapist could help someone with. Um, In fact, I've also taught a class called uh, Pelvic Health for Non-Pelvic Health Practitioners, because once you start asking people about their bladder function, you will learn all of your patients have a bladder, and many of them, male, female, um, just people with bladders, have issues that that are a bother, and they didn't know that there was help. Um, So physical therapy is definitely an option. And like I said, that could involve exercises or it could involve um, some sort of behavioral change, like looking at is your, are your bladder symptoms worse when you have coffee or wine or something else, or is it not related to what you're drinking at all? So we can kind of look at um, lifestyle areas to address. Um, But then there are medications and surgeries um, that are available. Uh, And I can say that very generally, the medications are typically more for the urge incontinence or overactive bladder syndrome um, symptoms. So those tend to help that bladder muscle relax a little bit. Um, So that I would say is probably the most common medication for incontinence. I am not aware of any pharmaceutical interventions for, um, for stress incontinence. Um, For stress incontinence, I would say surgery um, is is used more often for that. And that is usually to help support the bladder or to support the urethra so that everything's kind of a little bit more snug and firmly held in place. Um, And there there is one more surgery for urge incontinence. There are sacral um, stimulators that actually it's implanted to impact those sacral nerves that go to the bladder. Um, and though that has been improving over the years, but again, that is not a first line um, treatment, but that is something that's out there. That sounds very new and technological. <laughs> <laughs> it's So it's been around for a while, um, but again, I haven't seen a ton of it in my practice in the last decade. And I always wonder if that's because they get the stimulator and do great or if they're just never getting to um, to me in particular as a practitioner. Do a lot of people have to come to therapy after they have surgery to kind of do both, still strengthen it after operations? Great question. I would say, at least in America, that is not standard of practice. Um, I have worked with some urologists and urogynecologists over the years who um, – do have their patients undergoing these surgeries, um, do have them do kind of a prehab to make sure that that pelvic floor um, is working as well as possible and that, you know, that they have a good, healthy, um, good, healthy bladder habits before they go into surgery. Um, And also another thing sometimes we address preoperatively is actually constipation because that can actually lead to some issues for the bladder and for um, bearing down and, and changing um, how those bladder suspensions might work. Um, so we see a lot of people prehab. I don't see as many people post-surgery as um, as maybe I would like to, at least to see how they're doing. But again, it, it's always a question of, are they doing so well they don't need us or were they not referred back and didn't know there was more help? Sure. Do you... Would you mind showing our audience like one basic exercise to help from a physical therapy perspective? Oh, yeah. So it's actually going to look like me sitting here, but I can talk you through it. Sure. (laughs) All righty. So we are going to do the mysterious pelvic floor contraction, also known as a Kegel um, or a Kegel, depending on where you are. So sitting so that you feel both of your sits bones 
um, sitting firmly on the surface, whatever you're on, and then just sitting up nice and tall. And we can do this a couple different ways. So this is going to take a minute or two to feel all the different things. So the pelvic floor goes from our pubic bone in the front all the way back to our tailbone and out to the sides of our sits bones, our ischial tuberosities. So when we squeeze it, nothing else should move except for the muscles underneath, basically what would be sitting on a bicycle seat. So we're going to try the most... I would say the most classic cue, and then we're going to go from there. So what I'd like you to do is to squeeze like you don't want to pass gas in public. Keep squeezing while you breathe in and out. Nice, normal breath. And then relax it. Now, this is when I would say, I would want to know, what did you feel? Are you asking me what I felt? <laughs> I felt like I was did holding it if I had to go to the bathroom. Yeah, my... So okay. I, I think so, we, so should, we should clarify, you shouldn't feel your butt cheek clenching. It's like deeper than that. Correct. Like more to the middle. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll tell people, right. Cause not everyone can sense for a pelvic floor exam. So if we do a pelvic floor exam, I can tell definitely what the muscles are and are not doing, but not everybody is in a place where they're um, ready for such an exam. So I'll tell people, if I see you do this, that probably wasn't the right muscle. So if you're getting taller, if your face scrunches, if your shoulders go, this should be an, um, when you squeeze your pelvic floor muscles, nobody should know. Um, at least if you're dressed, no one should know. Um, so, but, but that, that's a very classic cue. Um, but also we're learning more and more that when you say squeeze, like you don't want to pass gas, the back part of our pelvic floor activates a lot. Well, usually urinary incontinence is in the front part. So what do we do with that? So some other cues that actually have been studied more in males, but actually clinically with some slight changes in words um, has worked well with many of my other patients who aren't males is to actually draw in the penis. Can I say penis on the podcast? That's, that's an anatomy <laughs> term. Um, so if you, so I want you to, I want anyone who's listening, just try that. So even if you don't have one, imagine what that would be like and see one, if you can do it, but two, did it feel different than squeezing? Like you don't want to pass gas. Yeah, I will. I will say on the guy side of things, it's not as strong as the backside, but you should be able to tell a difference. Definitely. And so I like to talk through with people because if you're going to do a, any exercise to meet a particular goal, you want to make sure that you're doing it right. And finding those muscles can be really hard for people. So having a pelvic floor exam can actually be really helpful for people like I have no idea because then we can use those tactile cues and give you that feedback. But like I said, like in the COVID world, we've done a lot more telehealth there's lots of people who, like I said earlier, just aren't in a place to do that. So I like to talk them through and, and, and we figure out like, can you feel that tension? And then do you feel it let go? And sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer no is no. And we just kind of go from there because like with any muscle, you should contract it. And then when you stop contracting it, it should relax. And your pelvic floor is no different than any other muscle in that regard. Is there like a certain time they should hold it for or repetitions they should do or? Um, great question. I'm going to say that it's, it's variable and very dependent upon the situation. Um, what I would say in general is I don't have people hold it much longer than 10 seconds. And one easy way to do that is to, when you do your contraction, so if you do your contraction and you just breathe in and breathe out and then do that again and then relax, you just did a 10 second contraction, approximately. Um, and so I'll usually just have people squeeze, keep squeezing as they breathe twice and then relax. And again, this is when I haven't had the benefit of doing a pelvic floor exam. I'll say, how many can you do before you can't feel it anymore? Um, and if they can do 10 really easily, and then they can do three sets of 10 really easily. Um, I start to 
um, and they're still having issues with incontinence, we need to kind of look at what else might be happening other than pelvic floor, potential pelvic floor issues, or is that a person who needs to come in and have an exam to make sure they're doing it right? Because if they really can do that many that well, it might not be the pelvic floor that needs to change.